Okay. We have also cross posted it on some of our uh, other pages SVG card, Digital Parliament. Mm. So, sir, uh, we are live right now on uh, Facebook. Okay, great. Okay, so well, today we have uh, uh, this is LIGC. I have lost the count of the number of events we've already hosted, and uh, we have been uh, backed up by International Institute of CSR, SDG CART. Um, Digital Parliament, uh, then Ek Baskar, uh, SGG Chopal, and uh, Ekja Foundation. Uh, today we have a very special guest with us. He's uh, a veteran in the space of sustainability and CSR. Originally a banker who has uh, walked through the journey of CSR and sustainability. And um, it is an honor to have uh, him with us, uh, Mr. Vinod Pandey, presently the advisor to uh, PTC Financials and a former managing director of SBI Foundation. Welcome, sir. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Dr. Hopkins. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Vinod. Nice to see you again. And yes, I'm looking yes. forward to enjoy you again. You've always got very interesting things to say. So. <laughs> You and where are you right now? Last time I think you were uh, somewhere, uh, I forget, uh, somewhere in Africa, somewhere? Yeah, right? um, last time I spoke to you, I was on the coast and uh, I'm still in Africa. Um, mm. uh, is that uh, I don't want to go to Europe right now, the COVID is really hitting the new peaks. It looks, it looks bad in your country too. So I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm staying safe here if, um, yes. among my books, which is nice. <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> great. So, Vinod, sir, it will be great to learn about your journey through the entire process and the evolution of sustainability and CSR in India that you must have witnessed. Okay, great. Um, should I start with my journey? Of course, sir. Sure, sure. Uh, this is a little interesting, you know, being a banker and then moving on to uh, CSR. But that's how, that's what uh, State Bank of India is all about. Uh, in State Bank of India, we believe that probationers, I joined as a probationer in 1980, uh, they believe that uh, probationers are not only jack of all trades, but masters of all of them. So uh, it was true, true for me also. You know, my first assignment in State Bank was an India-based trainee officer in Hong Kong. When I moved to Hong Kong, I expected to specialize in different kinds of Forex transactions and be a Forex cat, as we call it. We used to call it in uh, college days that he's a cat in this particular activity. So I was expecting to be a Forex cat. But I guess the bank needed more jacks to be masters. So on return to India, my first assignment was in a rural setup. And I moved to a semi-urban location working in retail and agriculture banking. But then on, I had an exciting journey, moving from retail banking to advances, to administration, government business, uh, controller of regions at all. Finally, I ended up in a branch called New Delhi Main Branch. This is in Delhi and this is one of the largest branch of the bank in India, where I did some good networking with, uh, because we had mostly government business. So I did a lot of networking with uh, government officials uh, in important government departments like defense, MEA, agriculture, roads, etc. apart from PSUs like Gale, Sale, DMRC, et cetera. This great networking and I was really enjoying it. And suddenly my top management thought he's great at networking. So let's move him out and I was moved to SBI Capital Markets. SBI Capital Markets is 
than uh, uh, Merchant Bank is a Merchant Bank, and uh, uh, since the day I joined the bank, I was always overawed by an I banker, but I never thought I would be one at any time, at any given time. But anyway, I uh, uh, joined SBI Caps in Delhi. I was heading uh, the northern region. There again, I was uh, doing some good work there. And suddenly, one fine morning, uh, uh, the managing director of SBI uh, Capital Markets at that time became the chairman of SBI, Mrs. Arundhati Bhattacharya. And I was working under her in SBI Caps. And uh, then suddenly, one fine morning, I got a call and said that you have been transferred to Mumbai from SBI Caps, and you will be heading CSR. And my first impression was, what a fall in status from an I banker to a CSR. I mean, I'm sure that someone in the top management <laughs> bank must be very upset with me for some reason. And so they have shunted me out. And that was my first impression. Uh, but then, uh, you know, uh, I started meeting the NGOs and people working in the social sector. Uh, well, there were NGOs working with persons with physical and mental disabilities, visually and hearing impaired, those who needed palliative care, etc. There were NGOs who provided health care to the poor, while others educated children in the slums. I visited a remote village, Sita Garha in Hazaribagh, Jharkhand where an Australian father, Father Tom Kyog, was running a school for tribal children for the past 30 years. When I met him, I learned that uh, he was also a father in a St. Xavier school in Hazaribagh, where I had studied from standard one to standard four. So uh, there was some connect. And when I met him and I saw the work that he was doing, I was transformed. I started getting involved and passionate about providing support to those who needed it most. What a transformation from a banker to a CSR professional. That is my journey in State Bank as a banker to a social uh, professional, I'll say. Post retirement from SBI, I was fortunate uh, to continue as a social worker, uh, uh, thanks to PTC Financial Services who uh, called me over to advise them on their CSR activities. And I continue with them for the past uh, almost five years. So, uh, but one thing I must mention here, because I've seen a lot of people in the uh, social sector handling uh, NGOs. Fortunately, I was never in the credit department in State Bank of India. Because if I had been in the credit department, the first thing I would have done when an NGO came to meet me was to call for their balance sheet, analyze it, analyze all their financials instead of the good work they were doing. I will probably also ask for a lowest tender for donations. That is what uh, normally people working in the credit do. So thank you, I worked in credit. <laughs> so I don't do that. I only focus on the good job that an NGO is doing and then we uh, tend to partner with them. So that is my story of a banker. So, which has been your favorite project till date? I'll tell you my favorite project till date has been uh, while I was there in State Bank of India. Uh, uh, I was uh, posted to, like I said, I was posted to head uh, CSR in SBI in uh, end uh, 2013. And uh, when I reported to the CSR department, uh, the chairman gave me a very big challenge. She told me that you have to create a non-profit subsidiary for State Bank of India to handle all the CSR activities of the group. That was a tough challenge. So I could have uh, taken the easier way out. I could have created a trust, which is hardly a challenge. Or I could have created a society, which is again, no big deal. You just need a registration as a society. I decided after doing all through, I was doing all my uh, work and going through the background of how foundations work and which is the best and which is most credible and all. I decided that we'll go for a section eight uh, not for profit company. Earlier it was section 25, now it's uh, section eight. So I thought I'll go for a section eight company. 
lot of my colleagues told me that you are taking a very tough challenge because Section 8 uh, for a company for a BFSI sector, that is the banking, financial service and insurance sector, is a very tough job. You'll have to get clearances from Ministry of Corporate Affairs, uh, uh, Reserve Bank of India, uh, Registrar of Companies, Income Tax Department, all that for a bank will be very difficult. But then anyway, I decided I'll take the challenge. And it took me almost uh, six, seven months. Uh, there were a lot of issues involved. RBI was not uh, 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 ready to have a non-for-profit subsidiary for a bank. But ultimately, I met them. I convinced them. And finally, uh, sometime in June or July uh, 2015, we got the clearance from Reserve Bank of India. And I'll tell you, that was the best news for me for a long, long time. Because setting up a Section 8 for a BFSI sector, which is the first and the only one, I think, even till date, is not a joke. For the logo and tagline, uh, I decided that we'll invite suggestions from our colleagues through internal mails. And uh, let them decide on what kind of a logo, what kind of a uh, signage and all we should have. And we got some 300 uh, uh, responses from our colleagues. It was tough selecting them. Finally, we selected two of them. And uh, I felt overjoyed because the two best entries were from women. And one of them was Ability Unlimited. You know what I mean. And uh, uh, so that was uh, a pleasure to see uh, them create such a good logo uh, for SBI Foundation. The signage, of course, was designed by me based on the logo selected and is unique and it should be seen whenever you visit Mumbai. It is made of thousands of pencils. It's only pencils and thousands. It took me over a month because the vendor we had selected, he made one, pencils broke, the signage did not come out well and all that. It took a month, but now it is. it has come out really, really beautiful. So that was a challenge. Uh, uh, that was the best challenge I've had. Uh, in SBI Foundation. Of course, if you want to know about the CSR projects, yes, they have been very, uh, very good CSR projects also in uh, SBI Foundation. One of my favorite was the SBI Youth for India. This was one initiative which is uh, really sustainable in the true sense. It gave an opportunity to a whole new generation to get ready for social work. Basically, it's an Indian Rural Fellowship Program initiated, funded, and managed by SBI Foundation in partnership with some reputed NGOs. It provides a framework for India's bright young minds to join with the rural communities, empathize with their struggles, and connect with their aspirations. The selected fellows mostly are from the metros or uh, urban areas, and from of the some of the top institutes, corporates of the country, and even abroad. But uh, uh, incidentally, in SBI Youth for India, we select only uh, Indian citizens because we want them to work here, not uh, to go abroad. And you'll be surprised when I was taking the interview, I had a girl from London School of Economics. I had a, a boy who did, uh, we took a uh, video interview of his from Singapore at midnight around two o'clock at night because that was the time that matched uh, India or something like that. We had someone from, uh, I think, Canada also. And they loved and they really wanted to come and work in India. It was tough for them because they were supposed to be posted or working in the rural areas with only 15 days leave allowed in a year. You cannot move out of the rural areas in one year. So imagine a girl coming from London School of Economics and working in the rural areas along with the NGOs on some social uh, activity or the other. So that was my one of the favorite uh, CSR projects that uh, we were doing in um, SBI Foundation. It had a lot of, uh, we got a lot of kudos out of it. Uh, yeah. So what, how did you, you have managed multiple projects from SBI Foundation to now uh, PFC? Yeah. So what has been your process to select these projects and how has it evolved over a period of time? 
see basically for selection of projects whether it is in uh, sbi foundation or uh, in present uh, ptc financial services pfs we have various criteria of course uh, for selection of projects we uh, the first is of course it should be under the uh, uh, companies act schedule 7 second uh, uh, reasons for choosing the project is uh, we have certain thrust areas in our policies like uh, in um, uh, uh, sbi foundation uh, when i was there then sustainability environment and all that that were not so important uh, during uh, 2011 12 and 13 and all that but in uh, pfs we prefer to uh, select projects relating to environment sustainability or one that has an impact on the underprivileged so these are uh, slightly different because one is environment and one is the uh, underprivileged but we prefer both we like to do both and uh, in pfs we have taken certain projects which are uh, which uh, relate to the environment and its protection that we'll discuss uh, in detail Uh, so how did you select these projects when you did that uh, were there any parameters any indicators that uh, you saw at that point of time and how do you do it now see uh, that time we used to call the ngos to uh, obviously make a presentation there used to be a committee which used to uh, oversee the uh, which used to take part in the presentation of the ngos and for state bank of india since we were working across the country so that was not a very big issue we could have worked uh, we could have taken projects anywhere in the country but uh, uh, one important project that we used to do at that time was skill development we in state bank we were running some 25 uh, rural skill employment training institutes we used to call it rcts so basically it was uh, for uh, giving uh, entrepreneur and other skills to the rural folk and these uh, skill development institutes were managed by state bank employees only uh, but the training we used to get it uh, through ngos various ngos uh, we used to know a lot of them so they used to give the trainees to our uh, or uh, the training were used to be given at uh, state bank staff colleges where we used to call professionals to give the training so that was it and uh, otherwise since uh, state bank uh, having branch just across the country and we had to show that we were doing good work we also had focus on education and health and other things like health we used to give a lot of uh, uh, ambulances across the country we used to donate uh, uh, very costly equipment like one we donated in calcutta uh, tata cancer research institute or something i think that is the name so we had uh, donated an equipment i think in bangalore also we had donated an equipment worth about 6 uh, 7 crores to one of the uh, uh, hospitals there something but only on the condition that any underprivileged who wants to come uh, for treatment in that college uh, in that uh, hospital they have to be given all these uh, uh, all the consultation and other things had to be free so that was all so it was the committee it was always a committee decision uh, to take on uh, which project we want to do or we don't know so in the current times which are the pressing csr activities a uh, public sector should take well i'll uh, tell you the uh, current times it's um, uh, the coronavirus uh, pandemic has resulted in a major crisis it's a triple crisis as i call it it's health economic and social so the csr act was recently amended also to include covid relief activities such as donations to the pm cares fund with a 100% tax benefit this is no doubt an init- uh, excellent initiative by the government however an unintended outcome of the pandemic has been the diversion of csr funds to covid relief activities cutting on funds dedicated to other long term social causes like education skill development women empowerment care for elderly special needs etc then a 100 tax 100% tax benefit has prompted many large corporates to donate 
most of their csr funds for this year to the pm cares fund in fact somewhere i read that almost 80% of many of the large corporates the csr funds are donated to csr uh, to the pm cares fund consequently csr support for education health skill development and similar social initiatives which are important are no longer on priority focus has instead shifted to distribution of masks sanitizers covid protection kits and addressing the migrant worker crisis and rightly so so my view is that in most of the psus their csr funds are almost exhausted whatever is left should be utilized in long term projects which are ongoing many psus what they have done they have ongoing projects but they don't have funds because the funds have gone to the uh, uh, pm cares fund so my view is that even if they cross the 2% mandated figure they should ensure that the ongoing projects continue even if they have to give it out of their profit it's social work so i think they should do it moreover due to the pandemic the world has gone digital even india so focus should now be on providing digital learning skills and other skill development programs of course but the focus should be on digital learning skills many of the migrant workers had moved to the villages now there if corporate start setting up uh, skill development institute with focus on digital education i think that will be really good you don't need to come to the cities to work you can work from the villages only all that you need is a computer so skill development and entrepreneurship development training can be focused on another thing that the government has done the indian government recently announced a 20 lakh crore economic stimulus package for the atmanirbhar bharat which is again a very timely initiative however my view is that a smaller package even a smaller package is required for ngos in the social sector also a directive to corporates to not withdraw or cease funding and support their ongoing csr activities and and uh, would also be a lot of help i suggest this because while we deal with the immediate challenges of the pandemic with a looming economic crisis that will see profits and consequently csr budgets of corporates declining we have to be prepared this means we have to ensure that there is no disruption in csr support towards our long term goals of education health skill development uh, of the underprivileged despite and amidst the covid pandemic we surely cannot afford the crisis that will be inevitable if we withdraw support from the existing csr projects those ngos need us now more than ever and we have to deliver on our long term corporate csr corporate social responsibility as much as we need to face the current pandemic so deliver without further disruption should be our aim and the time to act is now because a little later you know many ngos will close many underprivileged will not have even food to eat will not be able to take care of their families so i think the uh, social sector activity should continue the government should do something about this Yeah. Now, on this note, since you mentioned about digital education and um, um, things on the terms Pardon? of education, uh, now that uh, have the right uh, skill sets of people handling it. So, what kind of courses should an institution like IICSR run, and what is your message to us? So, help us on that. i think the current uh, uh, need is digital education i think uh, that is what is required like we have also seen that sitting at home for the past 6 months we hardly move out everything is ordered on my laptop or uh, on my mobile phone everything is delivered downstairs uh, uh, delivered in my apartment i don't have to move out so ultimately suppose i order uh, for example a simple thing like bread from amazon now the amazon they need people who are digitally uh, uh, really good 
to order it from a small shop, small bread manufacturing shop. He also needs to be uh, uh, digitalized. So digital education, I think, is the, the most important thing. There are many uh, organizations, like, for example, I'll say uh, SBI credit card. Now, they have to contact customers. Customers have to contact them. So everyone is working from home. You don't need to visit office. And how do you work from home? You work from home only if you have a computer and if you are proficient in uh, uh, computer. That's all. You need to have IT skills. I think that is the most important uh, skill that is required at present. Can't hear you. Richard, we can't hear you. <clears throat> yes, I think. Uh, uh, let me come in. Yeah, uh, please. So nice to hear your views on uh, CSR and uh, civil society or what yeah. we call NGO sector. Yes. I think yes. the sector is going through a crisis now, as you also mentioned. Uh, not only government funds are uh, decreasing. Uh, there's a shift from CSR also to PM care funds and other. And also there has been a lot of change in law in terms of FCRA and all. Yes, yes. Maybe what looks like NGO sector is not facing only a funding crunch. It is also facing a credibility uh, deficit at this point of time. Because what is practically happening is if uh, I tell somebody I am from NGO sector, they think I am an activist. Yes, <laughs> unfortunately. So think, uh, I would like to listen from you. What is it really, what is happening with the, this sector now? Because you know from both the sides. You have, mm. with, you have a passion for working with NGOs and you have been with the corporates. You have seen the government. So what is all this happening and why should, why should or how should a person who has a passion for working with the communities go through this uh, these times yeah this uh, crisis has uh, not that it is new but uh, the uh, credibility crisis among ngos has been uh, going on for quite some time in fact there is a trust deficit between uh, corporates and uh, ngos and that has been there for quite some time okay. but with the fcra uh, with the change in the fcra law somehow it has come in the open. Everybody now having read the FCRA uh, amendment, I think every, a common man also feels that NGOs are probably swindling funds or probably not doing the right thing. That is something which has come out in the open. So when we uh, select NGOs, when we uh, start partnering with NGOs, we have to do a lot of credibility check. Now, uh, NGOs receiving funds from abroad, the government, unfortunately, I don't know why, they do not trust them. I, for what reason, of course, detailed investigation and all they have to do, I would not like to comment on that. But there are a lot of NGOs in India who are working with local funds, with corporate funds, without any funds from abroad. I think they can continue and they will continue to do good work there are some smaller NGOs also, which I find, who people normally don't know. I've had uh, uh, experiences with uh, smaller NGOs nobody has heard of. I found some extremely good ones. But frankly speaking, I have also found some which are very shady. Because what I do when I receive a request for funding from an NGO, I try to find out if I have heard of it before. There are NGOs I have not heard of it. So I do a small, thankfully, Google is a big saving grace. Because what I did recently, I got a request from an NGO. I just Googled the name and I could see at least 10 sites where this particular NGO had done very shady work. I mean, a lot of other things. I won't like to comment. But... There are other NGOs I know who have come, I have Googled, I have found all the good work they are doing. So uh, it is a very, um, uh, I don't know, very complicated uh, sphere right now for uh, NGOs. 
especially those who are receiving from from abroad i think they will have a very very tough time because uh, no corporate would like to take the risk of partnering with them if they if they are receiving fcra funds i think that will become a little bit of a challenge Sure. but i'm sure the government will look into it uh, what the government should have done i think is okay you do limit the funds received from abroad and try to regulate in such a manner that you receive the funds through proper channels and ngos also get the funds i mean uh, this should not uh, uh, this amendment is a little uh, tough okay yeah i would not like to comment too much on this sure sure very definitely yeah um uh, sir as a institute in csr and sustainability what manpower do you foresee that people in future will require uh, 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 uh the uh, that is your institute yes sir or any yeah i think uh, you know now the manpower you will required uh, will not be much because now you will have to at least as far as i see the near future for the next 6 months this chinese virus is not going to uh, go away it is going to be there for some time till we finally get an indian vaccine to the chinese virus that is my view so once we get that vaccine i think it will take another 6 months to 1 year to stabilize and then people can start leaving uh, uh, moving out so that is when you will re require a lot of manpower because yeah, what subject should they know a pardon what subjects should they know what are the topics that they should be well conversant when they join in um, under you see uh, right now uh, if you really uh, uh, want my opinion i think like i said that uh, digital education is required and that is where uh, if they are proficient in uh, uh, the uh, uh, digital field then they'll be able to get opportunities to work so that is the kind of work that skills that people uh, the uh basically of the lower strata of the society that is uh, the uh, education that they require but if we are uh, talking of uh, skill development for the social sector that is social sector professionals okay. then i think uh, it can be uh, basically just fundraising is the most important thing that an ngo does apart from that i think health education these two are very very important i think education is the most important sector that india should focus on because an educated person will uh, contribute much more to the society than anyone and second thing of course is health that everyone needs to protect that the third is uh, i think climate and uh, uh, environment sustainability because uh, uh, that is one thing that is uh, uh, a challenge for india as well like for delhi we are in delhi right now and uh, uh, stubble burning has already started in punjab punjab and haryana so we are expecting the smoke to come over to delhi within the next 15 20 days so that is a, a difficult thing of course in pfs we are doing a project there uh, which does take care of this uh, stubble burning issue uh, but of course uh, only uh, a small uh, percentage of the Uh, crisis that punjab and haryana is facing we are tackling that so uh, i think digital education is important my view uh, so uh, so you have been a banker for a very long duration in your life uh, yes. what are your thoughts on responsible investments and how do you see its future in india well uh, responsible uh, investment yes the concept of uh, responsible investment is also new it was not uh, there earlier earlier the only responsible investment was making an investment in any asset which gives you a good return that's about all i think we didn't uh, look beyond that but now we need to look at uh, investing in assets which are environment actually socially and governance wise which are uh, doing good work so uh, that is one issue which has to be taken care of and many people are doing it 
in fact the younger generation also i think uh, this uh, responsible investment uh, started sometime i think during the vietnam war or something uh, somewhere around that time when uh, there were two people who said that uh, any company that is involved in the vietnam war we should not have any investment in that company that is probably how it started but now uh, the younger generation is also getting very conscious about uh, companies which are uh, uh, esg compliant and uh, that is where i think most of the uh, investments of go are going to be even uh, state bank we have a, a sbi mutual fund they have an esg fund also uh, not only uh, sbi mutual fund but many of these uh, asset management companies they prefer to uh, create esg funds where they are getting a very good growth and very good uh, uh, investment by individuals and uh, retail investments are coming in through those funds so that i think uh, companies which are esg compliant i think that is the best investment uh, now uh, so what would you prefer esg reporting or sdg reporting well sdg reporting has been going on for quite some years now and uh, uh, now i think esg is the latest uh, uh, i think let's prefer esg reporting i think uh, of course both are uh, quite linked to each other it's not that uh, uh, if you are doing esg reporting you are forgetting about sdg or sdg and esg they are more, uh, both uh, almost interconnected but uh, esg is the latest i think environment social and governance these issues uh, have to be taken care of like environment also i'll tell you in uh, pfs where i am working uh, our business in, in our business policy uh, we do funding for uh, large projects and we prefer to fund uh, projects in the uh, renewable energy sector so that is one of our uh, responsible uh, uh, investments uh, that we do and even csr activity like uh, we do which are environmentally sustainable and uh, Uh, we are targeting issues like pollution water conservation waste management etc all that we are doing in uh, uh, pfs as far as social issues are concerned we are running mobile health clinics to take care of the underprivileged employees are very well taken care of so uh, it's not that pfs is doing it but i think most corporates are uh, nowadays focusing on these things like all this work from home that has started during the pandemic i'm sure it is because the corporates are so uh, socially conscious of of uh, that they are permitting their employees to work from home and not laying them off it could have been uh, probably been easier in fact both my children are working from home so i'll tell you and they are different companies so i can tell you that companies are conscious and they are taking care of the esg uh, uh, scene scenario so before i ask message for the viewers i'm sure we all have a lot of questions over here dr my, my uh, hopkins we are waiting to hear from you something yes <laughs> yes <laughs> i like it when somebody says to me we're waiting to hear something from you uh, i hope you don't mean anything <laughs> well, <anything. laughs> but um i i i funny i've just been writing about sdgs and and the link to um, esg and the 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 investment worldwide in esg are, are tremendous figures i i've seen and heard of figures of something like 30 trillion dollars which for you and me is not much but for harsha is probably a little bit more than she seems to <laughs> yeah you you you're so right that 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 the world is 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 changing uh, very very rapidly and as i'm as i'm writing a book as i have been for the last few years but i'm near the end of it it's amazing how often i have to change bits of it and and i i can hardly keep up to be quite honest and so probably like us all around the table here we have a huge thirst for information and and for and for discussion and um and where where it's going to go and where it's going to be 
Uh, I don't know. And, and I, I think, uh, Vino, that you, you really express the, the contradictions very, very well. Um, uh, what's been going on in the social, economic and financial uh, sphere. It, it's very, very difficult to, to know where, where to go. Um, I, I, I've always started uh, when looking at NGO activity to think, well, shouldn't the government be doing that? And if not, why not? Um, and it's quite clear the government can't do everything. And uh, I often uh, liken uh, NGO work to a bit like, if you'll excuse me, Heineken beer. And Heineken yeah. beer has, a, has an advert that it reaches parts of the body that other beers don't. So... <laughs> Uh, actually, I don't drink beer, but anyway, never mind. <laughs> but I, I thought that that advert is is particularly good, and it also with NGOs, in in a way, they reach out to other people that the government is not. So quite often, I'm confronted by by NGOs, almost every day, asking for money for for this project or that, and of course, there's only a limited amount that any one of us can do. And very limited that that NGOs can do, and so I, I always re, re, go back to my basic uh, feeling about anything that an NGO does has to have three conceptual components, and I know you, you've heard me say this before, um, uh, which has to be macro, meso, and micro. Uh, the thing is that if uh, an NGO, and as there's so many in India, but also right across the world, do wonderful work, but they're very, very specific in specific geographic areas, usually, because they can't be everywhere, and nor should they be in many ways. So what I always think about with NGOs is that what they're doing should be linked either with, mainly with the government, but possibly also with the private sector and to, to work with the government to see, well, how come the government's not doing this? So that is the macro part of it. That's the policy part of it. So the NGO is working at the grassroots level. It knows what it's doing, has very good feedback, usually pretty good management to very dedicated people, but you don't see that right across the government because it's impossible for the government to do this. This is why I think a part of any NGO work should be working with the government or other institution in order to improve their, their delivery. And then, of course, delivery is what it's all about. And that's what I call the meso level. You have an idea, how best to deliver it and who's going to do it. And, you know, you've worked in government at a very high level and you know how difficult it is uh, to move mountains. It's like a mountain is there and you're trying to move it and you can dig it and dig it it all day. And at the end of the day, it's still well there and it's not moved. And that's the government is very much like that. And I always think of it as the, the elephant of change. And I, I'm working here in a, in a small country um, of what, uh, 50 million people. And I'm trying to get them to give basic income to everybody and all the, for all the poor people. Now, to try and find, even in this small country, not only the people who are involved and the institutions are involved, it's also difficult to get people to bring it onto their busy schedule and their busy portfolio. And Vino, you know this, and I'm sure Dr. KK is the same, is that you're working on many, many things. Another idea comes in and you say, I'd love to get into it, but I can't get into everything. So that is certainly is, is the area. And it's, it surprised me. I've actually been in this country for exactly a year. I arrived on October the 10th one year ago, thinking as usual, I'd come for a month or two. And then I, I decided to become a fisherman because I got fed up with the rest of the world, but that's another story. Um, and, I, and I moved to the beach, but then I realized, Michael, you know, you're going to be a lousy fisherman. You'll continue being a lousy economist. At least you know how, how lousy you are there. So I, I continued on that. But of course, because of that, I worked a lot with institutions, with government, with private sector institutions, 
all, in fact, the important people in, in this country. And I, it's amazing how difficult it is to get people to move that mountain. Now, I, I, I've, I, I've, in effect, most of my life, as you know, I've been a bit of an India avoider. Not because I don't love your country, quite the reverse. You are fabulous people. I don't know how to manage 1.3 billion people. I can't even help the government to manage 50 million. So I think that that is an absolutely huge problem. But what I would suggest is, is the three M approach, try and get that to the projects that, that you're looking at. Uh, the macro, meso and micro. Yes, of course, be as effective as you can in trying to do the project well, but think how it can be replicated, who in government or in local government or in the local city council or whoever is involved and how can that be um, in, in a collaborative spirit. The, the good thing is that when you talk with people uh, right across your country and any, any country, um, there are lots of very, very good people, excellent people. It's, there's a, a habit, a tendency to think, oh my goodness, those damn government people, they're just feathering their own nest and all they're looking at is to buy their next dasher or whatever. Yes, of course, you get, you get some of that. But it's amazing to, to think how many like-minded people you can find. And what's great about what Harsh has been doing as well, and let me congratulate her again on, she's working so damn hard, good for you. Harsh, I think half my mailbox comes from you. Marvel, good for you, you keep pestering us and we love to help you. So anyway, to, to, to cut my rather short story long, uh, let me go uh, to the, the 3M approach and look at that. And then of course, you know my, my, my feeling about sustainability and sustainable philanthropy. It's try and always look to see how such a, uh, a thing that you're doing can become sustainable. How can uh, revenue be made out of that out of that activity? Sometimes it's very very difficult. I mean, if you you've got a school for the blind, um, very very difficult to know what to do. Um, but, but if you are actually helping orphans, for example, to get a better education, they'll be richer in the future they would be able to have a contract with you and, and bringing some money to you as they get older. I'm not saying this should be done legally, but it should be done voluntarily. And I think that sort of thinking would help because my, my friend here in this country runs an NGO with 135,000 alumni. And they're all interested in what he is doing with his, with his NGO, but there's no mechanism where they're involved in financially in any way. And I mean, that seems so obvious, but here's one person with one NGO that I'm working with, and it's, it's pretty hard to do. So I think probably the moral of the story is never, ever give up. And I know none of the people listening, and I, I'm getting to know you all very well. None of you give up. I think Harsh is a great role model. She never gives up. And I know <laughs> how often she contacts me. <laughs> Thanks very much. Anyway, good to speak to you and to see you all again. <laughs> uh, Dr. Hopkins, you've been very generous with your words, I should say. Uh, and uh, I'm very <laughs> humble with all the appreciations and the adjectives that you've used. Thank you so very much. Uh, that's um, that's quite uh, right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's quite flattering. Uh, but I, I, I thank you is a very small word, but that's the only one that we have right now. So, thank you. Uh, we, we have Mr. Ninad, uh, who has the question. Ninad, may I request you to also switch on your camera? We all would like to see you. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, this is Ninad. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, Harsha, thank you so much for letting me join the call uh, because I believe since I'm on the other way, uh, I, me and my organization also share some uh, some views with respect to helping out or uh, reaching out uh, to masses uh, amidst this pandemic. Uh, I'll first of all introduce myself. Uh, I am uh, the co-owner of a company called uh, Sums Up and uh, it's an edtech company uh, which we have been uh, and we have been functioning since past three to four years. 
but predominantly our interest has been uh, uh, to reach uh, the underprivileged schools mm, the underprivileged students uh, from bmc uh, pre pandemic uh, we used to uh, function with a lot of ngos uh, uh, and giving uh, uh, by collaborating uh, with a lot of uh, bmc schools here uh, in mumbai and some uh, schools in bajreshwari as well uh, where we used to give them assignment solutions so that uh, you know their uh, scoring capacity increases uh, in the ss so that they can score well uh, but it used to be a complete offline model uh, but due to uh, the current situation uh, i believe not a single uh, school uh, school is functioning and uh, students are deprived of education or either uh, a, a, a mere touch or connect from the teachers or the schools so we had to come with a strategy where we can uh, reach or uh, help the uh, schools and the teachers connect with the students so um, uh, now uh, let me just take this opportunity uh, to uh, ask uh, like uh, and connect the dots uh, with what uh, sir vinod said and uh, mr hawkins rightly mentioned that uh, right now the uh, priority is uh, e learning and uh, you know connecting uh, to your masses through uh, a, a technological platform and uh, as uh, uh, you know it, not everything can be done by the government as they are uh, right now focusing uh, uh, and uh, uh, on health issues and uh, you know on the uh, on covid relief funds and all Mm, that is the reason we have been trying to collaborate and uh, you know connect with a lot of potential ngos uh, through which we can run a program uh, we have developed we have come up with a, a unique concept of uh, you know uh, running the school online uh, i believe every home has a of an android phone like as a uh, sir we know uh, rightly mentioned uh, the digital learning can happen on laptop but for us that is also not a necessity you can also even uh, run your school on on your phone uh, we have developed an application where uh, the teachers can organize their tests their video lectures their assignments on phone and get it solved from the students so in in short we can we uh, we have a developed a platform where the school can be run online so here and uh, i i know uh, that there are various other uh, uh, tech platforms as well like google classrooms is there uh, uh, i'm sure uh, microsoft suits is there uh, which but they are very costly and uh, so not everybody uh, tends to afford uh, the the uh, the pricing uh, to run the schools uh, but right now uh, for us uh, the priority is getting to the underprivileged school or schools and students and uh, how can it be more portable uh, as compared to uh, the other platforms so that anywhere any uh, at any given point of time uh, the education is reached to the students uh so uh, so so my my uh, thing just i wanted to uh, say like uh, we also have bharti trivedi ma'am uh, on uh, in our call uh, like the, uh, she uh, is the head of nurturing minds that's a very splendid ngo which has been working since past 10 to 15 years we have done a couple of projects with her as well and we have we are yet serving uh, some schools in majreshwari uh, which are under her umbrella uh so she can also you know uh, share her views on the same as well so uh, just uh, you know sir could you just let me know uh, is there any way that uh, we can uh, help uh, and uh, you know uh, serve a greater mass uh, with our platform or it can our platform be more helpful on that front see uh, i will uh, tell you what uh, you have been talking of um, online learning classes online uh, classes and uh, you are quite right that uh, nowadays all you need is a smartphone and you can uh, probably uh, study uh, not less than 7 8 standard or maybe even more uh, that is all that you require and uh, schools uh, i think for the next 6 uh, months to 1 year i think it's going to be difficult for students to go though the government plans to open the schools but i think it's a slightly risky venture so uh, uh, what you'll need to do is uh, uh, mostly the schools in india are run on the cbsc curriculum so you'll have to ensure that whatever uh, uh, you develop on your uh, uh, portal uh, should be in sync with the cbsc curriculum and you can focus on 
not all the subjects. If you focus mm -hmm. on all the subjects, there will probably clash. Uh, there will be a clash of interest with some other uh, portals as well. Yes. Maybe focus on one or two or something and really specialize on that. Okay. Uh, our, uh, so right now, what we have developed is a platform as a service, sir. So, so I'll just recorrect if I'm not, I'm not been understood. Uh, it is a platform as a service where you can, may you uh, be running a class for 7th, 8th, 9th or 10th or 5th standard or CBC or ICSC, it doesn't matter. I'm not providing you the content. I'm giving you a platform to run your school online. So right. the content creators are the teachers. They have got the authority to give the content, reach out their content to their masses. They can upload their videos. They can give their... In fact, we have developed a special feature which no, none other uh, uh, teaching platform has developed. Right now, I'll tell you the situation. Every school is running uh, their online classes and we're conducting tests to multiple choice questions. That is the only... That is the limitation. What you cannot tell this to expect the students to type your answer on platform, laptop or platform and then submit it. That is not how Indian education system works. And yeah. uh, every other suit which is there on education platform does that. But we have come up with a new feature where they can, uh, you know, uh, teachers can write the subject to question. They can take a snap and send it to everybody else. So that the students can get uh, the subject, the questions or the question paper in their phone. They can also write it on the paper, take a snap and send it to the teacher for correction, for evaluation. Teachers can correct the questions, answers, answer booklets on the phone itself just by doodling on scribbling on the screen, writing oh, yeah. half and all and all and then submit it so that everything happens online. You but do, we, uh, do you, will you need a special app or a special phone? No. Are doing that no teaching. just just an android phone and our application should be installed in it that's it but my my worry is that the students will probably be from the very very underprivileged uh, uh, background so they may hmm. not latest phone where you can tick or you can uh, do all that if that is possible or there is an app i think your app will give that facility yes. is it Yes, yes. So we have a sums up teachers app and a students app. Both are interconnected and mapped in a way that the specific subject teacher will uh, get to see only their audience. Okay. So geography teacher will not get English teacher ka, uh, audience or this. Uh, so that is that is uh, something which we have developed. And this is a two way communication which will be having between the teachers and the students. So it yeah, is this irrelevant of any content or any uh, background. Yeah, I think this looks uh, very interesting and uh, the government schools are uh, uh, ready to partner with you or something. How do you how do you promote your uh, app? Okay, now, so, so uh, right now uh, the feature uh, uh, has been just raised yes, uh, in the last week, which is the subjective one which I thought, uh, thought about. I told you, uh, and that is the thing which we have been waiting for. That once this feature is released, we'll start exploring various ways how to connect to the government or how to connect to various potential CSRs so that they'll be interested in this project and start working on it. So now the feature is released. We are looking for uh, you know uh, some ways where we can uh, collaborate and work. Uh, there are two um, connections that you need to, uh, there are two uh, places where you need to connect. One is the government department, the education department, because they'll have to uh, ask the uh, government schools to uh, take up this app. Okay. And uh, the second, of course, uh, the corporates who can uh, fund you in whatever the uh, activities involved you have. Okay. Mm. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. Sure. Sure. It works, works fine. Works fine for me. Uh, yeah, but it's very important for you if you want to increase the spread of this uh, number of schools that take up your, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, just that let me know if we can, if we can, we can talk on this offline. Uh, I would really require your guidance in that so that, uh, you know. You can uh, mail to me. Uh, you can mail to me and we can discuss. Offline. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arsha. I'll the email ID, sir. Sure, sure, sure. Thank you so much. Excellent. Uh, we've just started a poll on the courses that you would like to uh, uh, take up uh, at IICSR. So all the attendees, please feel free to take up the poll. We'd really appreciate it.
so in the uh, interview yeah. period, so what is your final message to an institution like us and to all our viewers who are watching you to all the NGOs who want to know more about uh, the entire process of funding to the government agencies and um, uh, maybe also to the uh, PM care fund uh, who, um, who, who are still trying to understand how can they be more transparent to the companies who are giving them CSR funds. See, uh, about the PM care fund, I don't think I can talk much. But I'm sure uh, the, uh, with the large amount of funds that the uh, PM Cares uh, Fund has received, I'm sure they must be uh, uh, doing, uh, they must be looking for uh, really good opportunities where they can utilize the fund. Of course, uh, I will suggest uh, to the government that uh, they should look for uh, uh, really uh, good CSR professionals who can uh, probably uh, guide them, which I'm sure they must be doing. Uh, I don't think uh, the government needs all these guidance from people like us, but they must uh, ensure that the funds are utilized properly because uh, PM Cares Fund was essentially for the pandemic. And the pandemic will probably be there at least for the next six months. And this is when uh, funds are really required for all the migrant laborers, for all the people uh, who are uh, underprivileged, who don't have work, who don't have food, who don't have health facilities. So they must utilize the maximum amount, amount of fund before March next year. And in case the pandemic continues beyond March, next year's CSR budget of all the corporates will just flow into PM Cares Fund. That should not be a problem. And uh, uh, that is my view on the PM Cares Fund. And I'm sure they must be doing something uh, really good. But except, yes, uh, they should also put it in the public domain that this is what we have done. This is what we propose to do. That will uh, avoid all criticism that comes once in a while. Uh, so that is about the PM Cares Fund. And uh, about the corporates, uh, I will suggest that even if you have to go beyond the 2%, please do. Please take care of the uh, people living in this country, especially the underprivileged. They really need your help. Uh, in fact, uh, I remember uh, one day I was just uh, uh, I had gone out somewhere in Gurgaon, and a rickshaw wala just came to me and said, uh, "Sir, I have not had a passenger for the past three days." I just handed him over 500 rupees, and he was surprised. He, he was probably expecting some uh, 20, 30, 50 or 100 rupees or something. I said, uh, you take this, at least it will take you over for a day or two. Though, uh, unfortunately, I didn't have too much money at that time. I could have given him more. So point is, these are the people who really need funds. And these are the people whom the PM needs to care. That's my view. Yeah. And uh, a message to the viewers. Very well said, sir. Yeah, and uh, uh, the message to the viewers, uh, J.R.D. Tata once said that I do not want India to be an economic superpower. I want India to be a happy country. And that pretty much could be the outcome if all the corporates follow the CSR norms as enumerated in the Game Changing CSR Act in its true spirit and honesty. Honestly, and that is a word I'd like to stress upon. If all of them give 2% of their profits back to the society every year, imagine the impact. My message to the viewers, therefore, is if you are a corporate, please give 2% of your profits and 100% of your heart to the social cause. You can give more than 2%, of course. If you are a student or an individual or anybody else, please give 100% of your heart along with whatever you can spare to the destitute and the needy. I assure you, we will very soon fulfill JRD's dream and make India a happy country. That's my message. Thank you, sir. We all would like to applaud if we can. Uh, sitting back at uh, home, it was a wonderful message, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it has been uh, a pleasure discussing with you on all the aspects of sustainability, CSR, 
and its evolution. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Padhyay, Dr. Hopkins, Nanan, Mr. Sumana Rao, um, all the participants, Mr. Daswani, uh, all of them who have been present today, Ms. Bharti, um, uh, Shreyan, uh, Mr. Yogesh, uh, all of uh, the viewers and all the viewers who are watching us on Facebook and the recorded videos. Thank you so very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. So maybe take, take care. a group picture. Thank you, Vinayji. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> take a group picture. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you, and be happy. Thank you Vinayji. So nice. Thank you, Padre. Thank you, Dr. Hopkins. Thank you, Dr. Hopkins. <laughs> So hi, Shreya.